In the late 90s, Nashville's Kurdish community reached a turning point. In 1997, a new wave of Kurds arrived with substantial organizational skills. The Guam Kurds represented civic leaders and highly educated Kurds who were targeted by Saddam for their relationships with international organizations. By that time, many Kurds from earlier waves had also achieved a stability that could finance entrepreneurship. In 1998, the Kurdish community opened the Salahadeen Center, the first Kurdish mosque in North America. People were looking for a place to rent for a mosque. They didn't have a place of their own where they can actually hear uh, an, an imam speaking in Kurdish. If you go to other places in America where there are a large Kurdish community, it's not concentrated like you see it in Nashville. You know, for Muslims, they have to pray five times a day, and it's preferable to be in congregation and uh, to have a place for regular prayers is uh, something very important. The Salahadeen Center established a focal point for Kurdish life in southeast Nashville. In turn, it provided a suitable location for businesses that catered to the daily needs of the community. Azadi International Foods, a Kurdish-owned market and bakery, is one of three groceries within 50 yards of the Salahadeen Center. You could go to the bakery and get Kurdish bread every morning, fresh out of uh, the oven. You could go to the Kurdish store, buy a CD if you wanted to. You go uh, to the mosque if you wanted to, it's Kurdish. You could go to all these different restaurants and have a Kurdish meal. A lot of my friends, when they come out of town and they see these things, it's, it's a shock to them. Like anytime you, you have somebody coming from out of town, they always go to the Kurdish shops towards the end. It's like going home, you know, you, you have to get something from home. Kamal Hassan, one of the two owners of Azadi's, works long hours to keep the market open seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. At the back of the market, a small bakery churns out vast quantities of two types of Kurdish bread. Customers come every day to pick up this staple item of Kurdish food culture. Um, I love Kurdish bread, but it's so time-consuming. Uh, before the bakery, I, had, I would bake the bread on Saturday or Sunday and b uh, bake a large amount to last the whole week. So uh, when I first heard that there's a bakery, I was just fascinated. I was like, yes, Kurdish bread, <laughs> which is the same thing for a lot of Kurdish people, especially around my age, uh, who are married and trying to really preserve the Kurdish food. <laughs> Food is such a huge aspect of the Kurdish family. Actually, we've always tried to maintain that Kurdish um, identity. No matter how difficult it was to balance outside work with the family life, we managed to cook somehow. <laughs> it's very heartening, I mean, to be able to really have at least one thing of the Kurdish uh, culture, such as food. Being able to still cook Kurdish food and sitting down together with your family and eating, I mean, it's very, very, it's, it's enjoyment for us. Um, it's the best thing that we can, you know, do for each other. And even talking from a woman's perspective, being able to cook, you know, the Kurdish style and providing it to my friends and family, I take that as a pride, you know, being able to still hold on to that. My husband's life and I, yeah, right now, we're in a very difficult situation because we hardly see each other, <laughs> which is not very typical for a regular Kurdish uh, family. He goes to school full time and then right after school goes straight to work. Um, I myself go to work full time and come basically home, take care of my child. So there was no way for us to fit in where we can have a normal lunch or a dinner together. And the best way we came up with a solution is breakfast. <laughs> We wake up at dawn to do our daily prayer together and basically cook Kurdish food together, sit down, eat together, clean up and leave the house until night. <laughs>